Now you described in the video earlier how you were working, you've got a responsible position in Loughborough University which mm. raises um, an important area which is about getting back to work and I, I think you're one of those people that tried to go back as soon as possible, at least initially. Yes. And, uh, yes. It's difficult for a clinician to give prescriptive advice but from a viewer's point of view, you know, many people do want to go back if at all possible and of course sometimes it's not possible you know the people that can be too well while, but assuming that's under consideration mm. what advice would you give them i would say um if your employer is flexible enough and they, they ought to be under the legislation um but that of course doesn't rule out people being rather awkward at times if you feel you can go back you should but Hmm. I was happy to go back to work whilst I was having my chemo chemotherapy while I was well for two weeks and ill for a week and I'd had a discussion with my manager about um, amended duties which is possible to do the manager has to agree to let you do other th less probably than you were doing and with no reduction in pay because the financial aspect is a big worry for people now I'm, I'm I was in a salaried position, I still am, and I was entitled to six months uh, full pay and six months half pay. So more fortunate than perhaps few people watching today. Um, I would say don't rush back to work until you have to go, because if you've been off, and I've been off for quite some months, it goes on without you. and. But that's hard to accept. It was hard for me to accept. And I, I went back in May because um, because my full pay was, was finished. And I had a very unhelpful letter from my finance officer that said, two lines, your pay is up. Nothing else. And they didn't send me any help or any advice or anything else. And uh, we talked about it at home. And I'm an academic, so I, I can be flexible on my hours. So I went in and it was crippling because um, we were under management review, my whole world was shifting, we were moving out of a building into another building, we now talk that this, we can't stay in this building, and we have to move out in July. Uh, my working world was turned upside down and that's what affected my, psychologically, my psychological improvement. Um, it was detrimental to my mental health going back. Colleagues, didn't want to say to me at times, others did. I, I would say be measured in your going back to work and I think you view things differently. I certainly view people differently. Things that seemed important to you six months previously or a year previously are not. And they're not life and death. Your illness is life and death. Your, your self-help is life and death. And getting myself physically okay was was challenging enough i couldn't i couldn't walk the length of a room without being exhausted so use everything you can if you've got to go back because of financial circumstances go back but have a discussion about it and ensure that you are having a phased return or amended duties and and don't be frightened to tell people that you are not up to it one of my one of my worries was that um my employers expected me to switch back into full-time mode as if I'm on a as if I'm like a, uh, one of those wound up battery toys that on and off and I'm afraid it's a long hard journey getting back to full full strength. Now what about for somebody who wasn't really able to go back full-time into the role that they really did like they wanted to return but they knew that they could only do um, their duties in an amended form, i.e. reduced hours or reduced days. Would you still say it's worth trying? Because we often recommend to people rather than feeling stuck, if they can go back some for some time and recoup some of their previous role, it can be valuable. Um, I'm not so sure. But your situation may have been different because I think as you went back, your department was under a lot of pressure. It was under threat, yes. It was almost it. bad timing. It, it, was, it was awful timing, 20 years timing. I think if the steady state had been there, I think I would have been a lot further down the recovery road. I, I feel I'm still in recovery. I think sometimes though, 
there's a lot of people try to go back and the effort is too much mm. because it's a big battle people if you're looking relatively well people think you are well mm. and if you're in the workplace their expectation is that you can do what you did before well you can't because sometimes your brain has been fried and you can't think at the same speed on sometimes you have physical stuff physical ailments that prevent you reacting or, and your priorities change so i would say have a go if you feel you can but it but it takes a lot of strength and, and a lot of courage to admit to people you're not it was hard for me to face the fact that actually i can't go back to where i was and it's, it's almost impossible to explain to other people it, you're not yes. 100 uh, that's right you and i wanted i wanted my my manager to put an, an email around to say i'm back but on amended duties has never happened he sat in a staff meeting and said oh we can see janice is back fighting fit i thought well i'm I, i'm not it's not so people's expectation and then you're forever having to remind people that you're not doing this or you're not doing that and it's an embarrassing conversation to have mm -hmm. and the onus and it's quite you have to build yourself up to saying to telling somebody well actually you want me to do this but i i can't yes there's a lot a lot of um it's, it's awkward to discuss reductions in one's capacity or things that you can't yeah. do. Yeah, and you, you can't admit it to yourself half it, the time. It's not good, it's not really healthy to have lots of those almost negative conversations. That's, that's so right. And you can't admit it to yourself. You don't want mm. to think. I don't want to think that I'm not as capable as I was previously. In, but a, in a way, it's better to accept that there's a reduction but always be aiming for an improvement. That's Yes, yes, yes. Um, to be getting there. I mean, I, I now say to people when they say, how are you? I say, well, it's been a long road mm. and I'm in recovery. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I think that's as much as people want to hear. Mm, usually. People don't want to hear the your tale of the 10-hour operation and the cannulas and catheters and they really don't. No, not unless they've got a special interest for some reason. Not really, yeah. yeah. Or, or they're very close friends. That's right. But you can't, you know, corridor conversation, you know, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm getting there sort of thing. That, yeah. That's as much as you can do. <laughs> There's another side to that return to work, which is what do you do if you're not returning to work? Now, if you are yeah. stuck at home, whether yeah. you're well or unwell, that can be a difficult situation. It can. On... on there are one or two friends from from the um, group I go to that have found themselves in this position. Um, and they're having to carve a whole new identity out. I, I'm carving it out. I think I've, well, I think I've changed in some ways. Not, probably not fundamentally, but I've changed in outlook. And these people, these friends I know are now, because of their their cancer it's and the drugs they're taking and the operations they're suffering their perhaps their mobility is gone or their ability to concentrate is gone so they find that you find that they might do a little more coffee drinking or they might do a little more um uh sitting about or a little more um I don't know. They, they, I just have one friend who's who's. She's quite a big crafter. She quite likes doing that. I don't know what. I think you have to be very careful. I don't think you need a lot of help. I think mm. you need help to readjust in your expectations, other people's expectations. I mean, your partner, if you've got one, that's hard. Um, if you can't suddenly do things. I do have a friend who phones actually, a, a breast buddy who phones me every now and again and she she liked to do a lot of uh, hill walking before her disease um, was diagnosed and now she can't do that but she takes her dog for a walk. Um, so perhaps find something that you used to do and you have to do it less or a, an amended version. And I don't know how people, if you've been sporty, um, I think that's tough for people who find the mobility's gone and their other things have Definitely. gone. I, I wouldn't know how to advise on that at, at all. I, 
One, one thing we advise occasionally is to try to come up with a role that you have at home. Right. A okay. role is more than just an interest or hobby. It's something yeah. that yeah. is a responsibility and generally leads leads to something and where you're being appreciated. Yeah. I, yeah. A, a classic example would be volunteering. If there's something yeah. along those lines yeah. you can do at home, yeah. that would be great. But well, it's not always possible to find something like that easily. No, I think the, the, I think being in touch um, virtually, perhaps with with some people, be, befriending people virtually, Definitely. or befriending on the phone. Yes. The befriending role is is a good way to go back. I think if you're ready for that. If yes, and I think um, my my friend, um, she had cancer 15 years ago, so I think it takes a long time before you can give back. I, I think the befriending role, we're going to see a huge development in befriending in cancer services because it's such an untapped fantastic resource. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I actually think it's very much two-way. The person who's befriending, giving their time, they really actually benefit from it. And the person receiving the time, meeting that person, also benefits from it. Yeah, I, so I, It's like a win-win situation. I would agree with you because I think when you say to me, uh, when you said to me, you know, how did you feel who was helping you? Well, when I felt nobody was helping me, just to have somebody to talk to, that's all I wanted. Yeah. I wanted just somebody to talk to outside of my network, my supporting family or friends. I, I just needed that one person. And from the healthcare organisational point of view, it's a free, it's a free resource. Sure, sure. And it's a good resource. I mean, so much so that when our our big lab died this year we you know husband and son couldn't face having another dog but then one day this summer i woke up and i thought oh, i want to get a little dog i just wanted something to to love <laughs> to, to um well to focus on mm. and i think that's another example if you've not had a cat get a cat or something that dogs are very demanding and they need walking etc cats are free creatures and they but the old stroking therapy was lovely <laughs> so i would say do that and so much so that i would actually i'm thinking about um having pearl and i training for patting therapy dogs dogs that go into hospitals and i was thinking about this on my last attendance at the royal infirmary and i a lady with one of these little dogs came out and I thought oh. it, it, it has been used and oh. trialed particularly in a let's say hospice setting it's yeah used. yeah I, I think it's it, it so is nice but if you if you've got the capacity to look after a dog or a cat mm. um, that's even better because you yeah. have that two-way relationship well and they're un unforgiving aren't they they're never they're never they never shout at you and they never <laughs> and they never do that they just all give aren't they